Scripture this morning is from Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of their birth pains. Then they will deliver up to you to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And that many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. And no, not ever will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. That if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so there will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. And from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. And truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. True, thank you. Those often quoted texts from Matthew's Gospel, particularly chapter 24, were given in response to a direct question by the disciples of Jesus, and that question is basically about the future. We've already studied the significant midpoint in that time of tribulation that you just heard read again, where the abomination takes place. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. When this abomination takes place, the time period, unlike any other on the earth, will begin. Let me show you where we are on our study timeline, so you can put in maybe a couple more details today, but I would recommend you just listen rather than try to write based on the amount of information we're going to cover. The last time we looked at different views concerning the timing of one aspect of Jesus' return, the rapture. It's the moment that Jesus comes in the clouds for his church. Those who have died, placed their faith in Christ alone, will rise from the dead, And those of us who are alive at that moment will be instantaneously transformed into our resurrection bodies. We believe this amazing event will take place here at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. Now, today we move ahead to the next major period in that timeline. 
spoken of by Jesus in the Gospels and spoken of again in greater detail as Jesus reveals this information to an aging apostle on the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw that is, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The images of the book of Revelation have been discussed and debated for centuries. Story writers and movie makers have twisted, mixed, matched, and mangled virtually every part of the book of Revelation, including calling it Revelations with an S. As soon as you hear somebody on TV say that, you know that they didn't check with somebody who knows the Bible. So it's my desire today to walk through the book of Revelation, sort of an overview survey, very briefly so that we can see what's coming. And as we read it, we see a storyline that takes us from some point in our future to the moment of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, what we call the eternal state. And today I just want to focus on the tribulation itself. Now let's begin with a few assumptions that we need to know before we get going. First, The book follows a chronological outline. The basic outline of the book is given to us in the first chapter. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. This is Jesus speaking. And I hold the keys of death and Hades right there for what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. What you have seen, we believe, refers to chapter 1, as John describes the revelation of where he was when he first got it. What is now refers to chapters 2 and 3. In those chapters, there are specific letters written to seven specific churches in Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. Most of those churches no longer exist. But they did when John received the revelation and recorded it somewhere around 90 to 95 A.D. What will take place later from that opening chapter describes the events from chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book. Now, even after the opening chapters, we see a repeated phrase that confirms there is a sequence of time. John says, after these things, or then, or after this. Chapter 4, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me in the trumpet, or like the trumpet, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. If Revelation has no chronological structure and is merely a symbolic representation of truth, its prophetic significance is reduced to a minimum. We believe the book of Revelation is a prophetic book, not just apocalyptic literature. Second assumption, we recognize a flow from seals to trumpets to bowls. That'll be clear in a few moments. Some look at the seven trumpets and the seven bowls as a simple repeat of the first seven seals. While there are some similarities, if you line them up in a chart, they do not match up exactly at all. Furthermore, the overlapping would do damage to the flow of the text, which describes the seventh seal as being open in order to reveal what's inside, namely the seven trumpets. Then the seventh trumpet is sounded to reveal the final seven bowl judgments. Now, having said that, Not all of the book unfolds in sequence. There are pauses or parentheses that show up several times to give us more information on what we're about to witness or what we just saw. They don't move the story forward until the timetable begins again with a phrase like, then after this, I saw. And such pauses which provide us more detail sometimes make it a little harder to put everything in a perfect chronological sequence, which is my desire ultimately, but very difficult. I will, however, do my best to offer a reasonable option for what that looks like. Next assumption. When symbols are used, take them at face value, unless they're otherwise explained in the text. On the Lord's Day, I was in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. 
and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. This sounds like the same picture that the apostles saw in the transfiguration of Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. There's no question on the context, especially in that last line, first and last. This is Christ. But what about all these other word pictures? Now, sometimes we're not given a whole lot more detail. We're just told the symbol and that's it. But like the book of Daniel, the symbols are often explained later in the context so we don't have to make wild guesses as to what they are. Take a look. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I hadn't thought until now, perhaps each church has its own guardian angel. Now, one other caution. For those word pictures that do not have an explanation, please don't try to spiritualize them. Leave them at face value until more information becomes available. Finally, the fourth assumption is chapters 6 through 19 primarily focus on the last half of the seven years, the Great Tribulation or Jacob's Trouble. The reference to time is consistently in this book 42 months or 1,260 days, which is the same time period as three and a half years. Furthermore, the Great Tribulation is mentioned more directly in chapter 7. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are the martyrs for Christ. Now, many think that the entire seven years are covered beginning in chapter 6, which will shortly start. I honestly don't remember thinking much about that kind of detail before my own recent study this week in the past few weeks. But I'm content to understand Revelation as describing the last half of Daniel's 70th week, with one exception. The first five or six seals, which we'll look at shortly, coincide more closely with what you heard read from Drew in Matthew 24, the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. If you check out Luke's gospel, he adds one more detail, which I had not thought about before either. Pestilence, diseases, deadly epidemic diseases. And then Jesus goes on to describe persecution, people turning away from the faith in numbers like never before, and family members betraying one another who know Christ. Finally, those family members who are being betrayed being executed because they stand up for the Lord. Jesus then mentions the event that marks the middle point of Daniel's 70th week. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. For then there will be great distress, great tribulation, unequaled from the beginning of time until now and never to be equaled again. So here's a parallel very briefly for those of you who like details. The order of events in Revelation and the order of Matthew's gospel are strikingly similar. We have war in both Revelation and Matthew. We have famine in Revelation and Matthew, death martyrdom, the sun and the moon darkened, stars falling, and divine judgment. This is all in just chapter 6 of Revelation, trying to parallel that with Matthew 24. You can do that on your own at some other point to get into more detail. But because of that correlation, the first seven seals may be taking place during the relative time of peace, if you remember that, the peace treaty sign. It characterizes the first three and a half years. That is peaceful for some, not for those who decide to follow Christ. So you ready to start? Okay. Chapter 1 gives us the setting which John received the revelation from Christ. Chapter 2 to 3 gives us the letters to the seven churches, actual churches in history that needed to be challenged. Chapters 4 and 5 set up Christ as both the lamb and the lion 
who will serve as the righteous judge over everything else that's going to come next. Chapter 6 reveals the first of the seven seals and some other famous characters. Seal number one, conquering power, the white horse. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Here we have the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The one on the white horse will later be Jesus himself, but at this point, it's best to understand this figure as the Antichrist. Seal number two. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. The second horseman brings war and bloodshed. They're followed by two more horsemen. Seal number three, famine, the black horse. And seal number four, death, the pale green horse. The color, by the way, is supposed to be the color of a corpse, that pasty gray pale green. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. There's a TV show about that right now, which I find intriguing. Did you notice that even the wild animals turn on humanity? This is a complete reversal of the dominion that mankind was given in the Garden of Eden to supervise over the creation. Everything is reversed. But what's worse is that this death horse, this fourth seal, brings an event unlike any other in history. 25% of the world's population will be killed. Out of an approximate 7 billion now, that would be 100 or 1.75 billion killed. 25% of the current world population. The next several seals reveal those who have been executed for their faith so far. Seal number five, the martyrs under the altar. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. From this point forward, we will see those who are suffering for the faith called souls or saints. They're not called the church. Our understanding within dispensational thinking is that we are now in the church age and certain things are available to the church, including its titles. But once the church age is complete, these saints belong to Christ, just like we do. Nothing's different there. Yet instead of being known as the church, they should be considered like those who became believers before there was an Israel, like Adam and Noah. Saints who come to know the Lord in this period are described as saved Israelites or saved Gentiles, never by terms which are characteristic of the church, like the body of Christ. One of the reasons we think the rapture will happen early, because the church doesn't show up anymore until the very end as the bride. Next comes a great earthquake. Conservative scholars identify the revealing of the true nature of this world leader to come to take place at about the midpoint in the narrative. The abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of is not mentioned specifically in Revelation, but the wrath of God is specifically mentioned at the end of chapter 6. And as we read earlier, the phrase the great tribulation is stated in chapter 7. So by the time we reach this seal number 6, the great tribulation appears to have begun if it didn't already start earlier. And it introduces the divine day of wrath. We also know that as the day of the Lord. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair and the whole moon turned blood red. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? 
Prior to this moment, the judgments that were unfolding, war, famine, death, and the martyrdom of the saints, had been primarily of human origin. But God's hand is clearly directing this punishment, beginning at least with the sixth seal. And what's fascinating about this is the reaction of the people. And this is not the first time, or not the last time you're going to see this. Regardless of their social standing, they recognize that God is behind what's taking place. And they recognize their own guilt, rejecting the God of the universe. But they don't care. What sinners dread most is not death, but having to stand before a holy and righteous God. At least they will when it happens. Now, before the seven trumpets come into play, we come to our first break in the chronology. This is our first pause. And you remember this from your study a week or two ago. The 144,000 Jewish evangelists are sealed and protected. Now, based on the placement in the narrative, it appears that the 144,000 have been living through the first half of the tribulation or the first seven years, but are sealed for the remaining three and a half years. That was something new to me. I thought they were there the whole time doing their thing, but maybe not. Either way, something unusual happens at this point when the seventh seal is unfolded. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Do you see how one folds into the other? It's not an overlapping. Trumpet number one. After this silence in heaven, I guess you call that a dramatic pause before things get really dark. Hail and fire with blood. One third of all the earth and trees will be destroyed and all the grass will be burned up. Fortunately, grass grows again because it's going to be burned a second time. Trumpet number two, the mountain is thrown, a, a specific mountain is thrown into the sea. And one third of the salt water and sea life is dead. One third of the ships will be destroyed. Trumpet number three, it's a star called wormwood, which means bitterness. One-third of all fresh water will be contaminated. Trumpet number four, one-third of the sun, moon, and stars turn dark. This whole period, we have objects falling from the skies, plants and water becoming contaminated. We might call the mountain an exploding volcano. We might call this thing falling from the sky, this wormwood, a meteor. But we don't have to make something up to sound spiritual simply because we're not really sure what they are at this point. And when the three, then what comes next is called the three woes. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. A woe is a terrible judgment. Jesus spoke of them, too, in these last few days before his crucifixion. In this case, they correspond specifically to the three next trumpets. Trumpet number five, locusts and scorpions you've never heard of who have power to do things pretty bad for five months. And here's a case where a star is not a heavenly object, but an angel. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given a key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, when who? When the star opened the abyss. You see how this works? Smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Revelation is one book where we witness the presence and activities of angels like no other book in the Bible. I lost track of how many different sets of angels are doing what they're doing through this book. You could probably do it sometime. It's into the scores of angels. And that's just beyond the ones that say, you know, multitude upon multitude upon multitudes. And since God is using angels at this period of time, this may be one of his loyal servants in this case, opening this up. Or it may be a demon. And you've got to keep this in mind as you go through. Both Fallen angels and obedient angels are under the sovereign control of God. Even Satan himself cannot do anything without God's permission being given first. And out of the smoke, the locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given any power to kill, or they were not given any power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I remember reading a classic book before I was a Christian. 
in high school, and it came out of the late 60s called The Late Great Planet Earth. Hal Lindsey, the author, had looked at this particular passage in chapter 9, and he thought it was describing modern warfare, more specifically helicopters with special attachments on them. That may be the case. But I don't see any reason not to take this description as actual locusts. Now, granted, they are very perverse in their appearance, and they're very unlike normal locusts who usually go after plants, not humans. But this is unlike any other time we can ever imagine. And as you continue into chapter 9, you'll learn that these creatures have a leader. Locusts don't usually do that either. So let me tell you where I've come to understand such language, which is similar to what I said when we started. I will take the language or the, the, the picture at face value. If the image is explained a little later, like this time the star is actually a spiritual being, then I can be confident that God gave us an understanding of the text at that point. If, on the other hand, I can't understand how a locust like this could exercise such power or exist because I can't comprehend or ever picture such of those things in the National Geographic magazine, then I need to accept the mystery of what it says and let God surprise me when it actually happens. I assume, by the way, that we'll have a window that we can look down and see what's going on when this is all unfolding. Now, if I'm wrong about that, I'm okay with that too. It's just an opinion. In this case, however, I'm most comfortable with a third option, besides the locusts and the modern weapons, as an answer. I cannot escape the larger context. Have you ever heard me say that before? Which tells us that these things came from the great abyss, the place that Satan's going to be locked up later for a thousand years. So my take is that these are demonic beings of a specific shape and purpose. The first woe at this point has passed. Two more are coming. We come to trumpet number six, where four angels are released from the four corners of the earth, and with them comes a mounted troop, cavalry on horseback, numbering 200 million. One-third of mankind will be killed at this point. Once more, mankind is the direct target of the trumpet judgment, and out of seven billion, where we already lost 1.75, we now have another roughly 1.75. That leaves three and a half billion left on the earth, or one half of the world population from where we started at the beginning of seven years. The number 200 million was attributed historically, and I think Hal Lindsey mentioned this too, 50 years ago, to the one nation that at that time could boast 200 million in their army. 200 million. Years ago, Red China claimed to have an army of 200 million. 1965. Now, I can live with that possibility. I I can. I don't have any problem with it. I'm not going to die for it. But once again, the description in the context lead me to be more comfortable with 200 million horsemen as demonic entities. A combined Allied and Axis forces at their peak in World War II totaled about 70 million. An angelic army of 200 million demons is not that hard to imagine. Now, at the blast of the sixth trumpet, we enter another break as we move into chapter 10 and 11. So all the motion pauses as we get some more information. And here we're introduced to the two witnesses, which you just studied in your small groups this week. The execution and resurrection of those two witnesses will bring another disaster. After the little scroll, the two witnesses bring, are brought back to life, and 10% of Jerusalem is destroyed and 7,000 more die. Then we have the end of the second woe. As that's passed, the trumpet number seven announces the worst of the Great Tribulation. And trumpet number seven starts with something very basic. It's a voice announcing God's temple is now open. Once more, the action stops, and we're introduced to a couple of other people that have become the prominent characters on the world stage in the second half of the seven years. In chapter 12, we see the dragon cast out of heaven. That's Satan. Before this moment, Satan has enjoyed access to God. Check out the opening chapters of Job. At this point, no more. He's literally kicked out and thrown down to the earth, which makes this planet an even more uninhabitable place because of the demons tormenting and influencing mankind without any boundaries whatsoever. It'll be worse than every horror movie ever combined. 
And in chapter 13, we now see another character, the beast from the sea, which is the Antichrist, and the beast from the earth, which is the false prophet who leads people to worship the Antichrist. They coordinate their efforts together to continue to deceive everyone while they exalt the worship, literally, of Satan. And people will follow in droves as false miracles and wonders are performed to prove or to try to prove that this Antichrist is really the Messiah. These last two will put an end to all commerce and all religion on the world except what they control as they demand that all people embrace a proof of their allegiance. And this is where we get that famous mark. The mark of the beast comes into play at this point, the number 666. They will willingly take that mark on their forehead or on their arm, as the Bible describes, willingly following to hell. Now, we come to chapter 16. The contents of the seventh trumpet are revealed. There's seven bowls in that trumpet. And with the seven bowls, the judgments reach the most intense point. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The number of people affected increases compared to what we just saw. Remember, about half the population is already gone. And those are just ones killed from the plagues. They didn't really include the number of people executed because of their faith. And while it appears that some of the saints may be protected somewhat from what comes next, the rest of those who have chosen to follow the beast will receive the worst of it. And the first bowl is similar to what happened to the Egyptians during Moses' day. Bowl number one is painful sores. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. They appear to be some kind of skin ulcer that will not heal. And one author suggested that when a person is in such discomfort, like with those kinds of things, they would likely affect his attitude and interactions with other people. So as you picture things going down, this is probably going to be the worst among human interactions with one another. Bowl number two, the sea turns to blood. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned to blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Bowl number three, the rivers turn to blood. This is 100% now. There's no, like, safe spot. The third angel poured out his bowl, and the rivers get springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard an angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are, and you who are the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. They call that talionic judgment. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The punishment fits the crime. That's what's going on here. As I heard the altar, I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord, God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Next bowl, scorching sun. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The next bowl is deep darkness. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven still because of their pain and their sores. They refused to repent of what they had done. And here's an indication that these bowls may come in quicker succession than the seven trumpets or the earlier seven seals because they're still cursing God when it's dark because the sores have not gone away yet. The last three bowls are a little bit more political in nature. They continue to impact the rest of the environment just like the darkness did. Yet bowl six prepares the way for a battle that you've heard of. And many people outside the faith have heard of it as well. The Euphrates River dries up in bowl number six. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river of Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This, by the way, is in modern-day Iraq. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together in the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Yes, there really is a battle of Armageddon. 
The final bowl is not poured out on the earth, but in the atmosphere. Bowl number seven, the biggest earthquake. The seventh angels poured out his bowl into the air, air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of all the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about 100 pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. The full impact of this bowl will not be revealed until the next couple of chapters. Complete that picture. And look at the last phrase in verse 17. It is done. I love what this one writer said concerning the similarity between that statement And the one like it, the very last words of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here's what he said. Men would not have the Savior's it is finished on Calvary, so they must have the awful it is done from the judge. Wow, is that sobering. The consequences of the final bold judgment appear to be detailed in the next couple of chapters. Chapters 17 and 18 fall into another break in the chronological sequence a pause to give us more information again. And what comes next is the picture of the fall of Babylon. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. The angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, It was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Now, we're not told if this is an actual city rebuilt in the middle of Iraq where ancient Babylon used to be. Once again, there's no reason to assume that God cannot or will not rebuild that city. But it's also a name that carries with it a lot of meaning. Throughout the Bible, the name is used to describe a world system that rejects God. That system involves government, immorality, faith, and finances. It's a worldview. Babylon is used the same way we use the terms Hollywood or Wall Street. They are actual locations. But the first is also a reference to the United States economic system. Hollywood is both a place in Los Angeles and an industry with its own worldview and its own practices. In Revelation, Babylon, in a similar way, has two specific core components that are given to us. The first is the religious sphere. And what's described in chapter 17 is the destruction of this false religion called Babylon the Great. It's the end of a one-world religion that will characterize the last days. We're not quite there yet. This religion is a perversion of true faith, and historically, Babylonian-like religion included all kinds of sexual practices as part of their worship and the interaction and worship and contact of demonic entities. By this point in history, it represents everything that's anti-God, anti-Christian, an ecumenical practice that rejects core differences between faiths, welcomes all kinds of paganism, and unifies everyone under some false premise. We don't know what that false premise is, but ultimately that unifying premise will be overtaken by the Antichrist. And his premise is the worship of self and Satan is the only religion left. Now, conservative scholars view this chapter as an explanation of how this woman on the beast, this harlot, developed over history and ultimately was destroyed. So you have like a capsule, the entire timeline of this Babylon harlot. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. Sound familiar? The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world 
will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seventh and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for who one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. Okay, flashback in your mind now to Daniel, 70th week. Here's what's going on. The seven heads and the ten horns mentioned have to do with the empires that came and went where this false religion influenced that kingdom or all those kingdoms. Here's our understanding of this. The first five have fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. One is. Rome was in existence when John received this revelation. The other has not yet come. We would call that the revived Roman Empire somewhere in our future. And Antichrist Empire is the last one. The beast is the eighth king. Let me try to explain this. By the time of the revelation, the harlot is influencing or riding on the back of yet one more government system one made up of some combination of nations that are dominant at some point in our future. We don't know which ones. Antichrist will be one among many world leaders at that time, but he will gain recognition by his brokering this peace treaty with Israel. Consider him a prime minister of some nation who's going to come up with this. And everybody's going, wow, that's pretty cool. But he's only one among many. That world religion will be an ally of the emerging world government. And remember, the Antichrist doesn't reveal who he is for another three and a half years. Like other politicians of his day, the Antichrist will use this harlot, this false religion, for his own purposes for the first half of the tribulation. So here's my understanding of the chronology so far. Beginning of the seven years, the rapture takes place. The ruler that will come, according to Daniel 9, the Antichrist, will broker a peace treaty with Israel for seven years, somewhere at the beginning there. With the believers gone... The new world religion gains prominence and persecutes non-believers to this new faith, whatever this thing is. A united group of nations develops in some raw form. So this is all kind of percolating and coming to the surface. It appears that things are moving forward in the world where a single religious system overtakes all the others. Yay, we've got unity. And the thing that the United Nations was created for, I'm not being facetious, this is why they exist, was to bring world order and one government is starting to come together. So people will probably be pretty excited about it. Near the middle of the tribulation now, let's fast forward a few years, the Antichrist will be credited with bringing back to life some part or all of the ancient Roman Empire. From that resurrection of the revived Roman Empire, people are going to be amazed. Here's the text. We go back a little bit in the 13. One of the heads of the beast seems to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like him? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and exercise his authority for 42 months. There it is. Now, something this may be an actual assassination attempt on the Antichrist, and I'm fine with that too. Yet the more I've read, the more I'm inclined to look at this ten-horned, seven-headed beast as a reference to the world empires just like Daniel did. And so with that understanding that we're talking here about this fatal wound of something that came back to life as part of the empire, here's where this chronology would continue. This Antichrist will emerge, replacing three of the leaders and taking control of the whole thing. So it comes together as a revived Roman empire. He knocks a few out and takes control of the whole thing. It's understood that he represents the seventh king. He came out from within that thing in chapter 17. And he comes out of the seventh kingdom, the revived Roman Empire. But he won't be content to rule with all these other guys, namely ten others. So he'll take charge of the remaining kings and make them his slaves. Then he destroys the world religion Babylon because it served its purpose. The revived Roman Empire that helped him get into power. And he becomes the eighth king over a new empire that's exclusively his. 
it seems best that this whole takeover sequence would happen somewhere in the middle of the seven years after he reveals who he really is. So chapter 17 would be describing the history and ultimate fall of Babylon as a religious influence. And chapter 18 describes the fall of the commercial world system. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe, O great city, Babylon, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. This is the end of the monetary system and monetary economy of the globe. As Antichrist creates his own system of buying and selling by using the mark of the beast. The nations mourn over the loss of all that is valuable to them while the Antichrist rules everybody. But then we come to chapter 19 and we finally have the return of Christ. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. That's us. Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. What comes next is up to you to read. But for the rest of us as a group, we're going to have to wait till next Sunday as we go into more detail on the second coming, the physical return. The tribulation is a dark and wicked period, like living through a nightmare where you are unable to wake up. And these images of what to come, what's to come before the Lord returns is why believers are motivated to share their faith and help people understand repentance so they don't have to face this. If you do not know Christ, please do not let your understanding or misunderstanding keep you in ignorance. Speak to the person that asked you to come to this church the first time, maybe years ago. Speak to one of our church members. Speak to myself. Christ wants so much for you to understand who he is and what he has for you so that he can give you new life now and purpose that will take us into eternity. He wants us to know his son and our life purpose. No one but Jesus Christ can forgive sin and provide us new life now and new life forever. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. Lord, thank you for giving us a chance to go through a survey of this amazing book. And as we continue our personal study, both this week, maybe in our small groups or for the course of this particular series, Maybe some of us will be just continuing to study this until we no longer wake up. In the time that we still have left, help us to comprehend more clearly who you are, what you have for us, and how much you desperately care for us. And I pray that you would shake up the hearts and souls of those that we care so much about, that they would recognize their world as having some nice things, but ultimately not much hope without you. Give us the chance to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Allow them to join your family before something happens. Amen.